The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Who knows, he said, God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come over Jonah to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah, so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Well, this morning, like we did at our earlier service, we're going to hear some reflections from four of our 53 or so teenagers who've just returned from their mission trip to Chicago. Now, you are probably asking the same question that Ryan Casson, our associate director of music asked this past week as we were planning the service when he said, so what does the biblical story of Jonah and the whale possibly have to do with our youth mission trip to Chicago? And it's a good question, really, for, for after all, this tale of Jonah is a very weighty story that has stumped even the best of scholars for centuries with this storyline and its purpose. So how does this story fit in what it is we come to do this day? Well, most scholars suggest that the story of Jonah is probably to be read as an allegory. Now, our teenagers know what that is, but let me remind all of you, as well as myself. An allegory, a symbolic figure, represents a truth which is being hidden. The symbols are not genuine, but the truth they point to is. You remember that? So in this biblical story, just as Jonah represents Israel, which has turned its back on the Lord, and he is swallowed by a fish, which represents Israel's Babylonian captivity and exile, and Jonah's being called to preach to the Ninevite means Israel's finally getting on board with God's plan. So for our purposes today, Jonah could represent our teenagers. The fish could represent the United Airlines plane, which carried them in its belly on its two-hour and 22-minute flight to Chicago, and the people of Nineveh could represent the many lives these teens touched along the way while they were there. But that is a stretch. Would you not agree? So if we can't approach this story as an allegory, as we speak about what it means for us on this mission day, then what shall we do? Well, I've chosen this story because of its history. I've chosen this story because of the reason that the story of Jonah was written in the first place. Do you know why it was written? You see, this story of Jonah was written around the 4th century, after the Jews had suffered exile in Babylon, and it was a searing experience for them. It left Israel with a bitter and hateful feeling towards foreigners, people who were different than they were. And now all that the people of Israel wanted was for God to destroy all those people who were different from them. In fact, in the time that Jonah was written, 
right in the heart of Jerusalem, any day of the week, you could hear xenophobic super patriots and nationalistic priests preaching that the people of Israel were the only true people of God. And in fact, in this Jonah story, the figure of Jonah himself represents that self-serving, narrow-minded, echo chamber perspective that looks down on others as less than, if not also insignificant. As you heard, Jonah was angry that God would actually love another people. For like the rest of Israel, Jonah despised outsiders. And his figure stands for all the hostility and prejudice the Jews felt towards people of other races and other beliefs. So, the Jonah story was written to show Israel that God's love was not exclusive. And that yes, God may have loved who they love, but God did not hate who they hated. Or to put it another way, this little book of Jonah was written and placed in the Old Testament as a protest, as a protest against any religious perspective that is so exclusive, so narrow, so judging, and so damning that it begins to fight God and God's desires for the world God created. And this book of Jonah wants to argue with the prevailing view of that day and remind Israel that they were not the only people in the world that God loved. But rather God loved all people, no matter where they lived and how they chose to worship. Now you may say, but weren't the people of Israel the chosen people of God? And you'd be correct. But to be God's chosen was never understood to be God's specially favored people. No. Israel was not chosen for favor. Rather, they were chosen for responsibility. Responsibility. Such is the one Jonah is being called to in this story. The responsibility to go and help others who might be in need of the bountiful, exclusive, overwhelming love of God. So you can see then why I think this story of Jonah is so fitting for a day when we celebrate the return of our youth missionaries, because this book of Jonah argues against any view of religion which separates, any view of religion that wants to divide the, the saved from the unsaved, the, the believer from the infidel, the, the insider from the outside, the friend from the enemy. And it proclaims that we as people of God have a responsibility to one another that transcends all the differences that might divide us. This book was written to say that God loves and cares for us all no matter who we are. And that is why this story of Jonah is so fitting for this Sunday. Because it tells the story of God's desire for God's people for us to go and share who we are and why we are and what we are with others. Learning to treat people who are different from us with the same gentleness and compassion and forgiveness that we treat the ones we love. Now granted, our teens were not called to Nineveh, but they were called to Chicago by God, and each and every one of them accepted that call to go. Now, the interesting thing is that the book of Jonah is the only one of two books in the Bible which ends in a question mark. It ends with God asking a question. You can see it there in your bulletin. God asked, am I not to care? It's an invitation in that question, an invitation to Jonah. Should Jonah not also care then? Well, how proud we are today that our modern-day Jonas, teenagers from our community church, have heard God's question to them and have responded. Yes, they have said, we will care. And for the next few minutes, we're going to be allowed to listen, hopefully prayerfully and expectantly, to a few of these modern-day young Jonas as they share their whale tales of caring, insight, and faithfulness with us.
Let us begin. Good morning. My name is Eric Schulte. The trip began with all 53 of us packed into commotion, milling about and talking with each other about what was to come in the next week and playing various card games. We knew ahead of time that we were to be expected to go to sleep in the sanctuary for about two and a half hours only to wake up and make the journey to Orlando. <laughs> Needless to say, the chaperones didn't exactly get any sleep that night. Well, sure enough, 2.30 came around and we packed up and shipped off to Orlando. After the hectic and loading and bag check, it was estimated that as a group, we spent a good hour and a half going through security. So pretty much your average morning going through Orlando International Airport. Finally, after we had all eaten and mellowed out, it was time to leave the familiarity of Florida behind for the new world of Chicago. Upon arriving at the First Church of the Brethren, we found ourselves surrounded by the sight of something that most of us had imagined, but probably none of us had ever really seen. The effect of driving through the beauty of Hyde Park, only to glance down and then seem to be just plopped into the middle of an east side neighborhood, took us all by surprise. The clean open yards of Florida had been replaced by Chicago's fenced-in brick urban houses. After a tiring day of tearing toys apart to be recycled, we were given a mission of going into the city with one dollar to try and find dinner. If you've ever been around a teenager when they're tired and hungry, you can imagine how upset we were. However, we came across something special and something that was far from any of our expectations. We were told we could ask anyone for change and could look for any other spare change on the ground. But to begin with, our group had to first find the closest store in order to buy some cheap food for dinner. Sean Kenny and I came across a man in his 50s and told him our mission and asked him for directions. He was sweaty and looked like he didn't have any money for himself. He graciously and excitedly told us of the two stores in the neighborhood that were available to us. We started walking towards one of the stores along with a man, and a ways down the road, he asked us something extraordinary. He offered us some of his own hard-earned money in order to help us with our mission. We felt in our hearts that, even though for this one night we only had one dollar for a meal, we realized this guy probably has many nights in his life without enough money to make a real meal. As a result, we respectively de declined his offer and continued on our way. The compassion and purity in this man's soul truly reflected the spirit in, of God in a way and a place in which we would never expect. Some of you might be thinking that you can't get much meal on just a dollar, but you sure can when you pull your money together. We first decided that peanut butter was to be a staple of our meal, so we bought a jar and decided to get some bagels to go along with it. Now that the main course was decided, we moved into just filling food. So after walking through all the five aisles at the Aldi, Aldi store, we decided to buy chips and salsa as a kind of appetizer. And then generic brand cookies for dessert. After checkout, we came to the conclusion that we had $1.23 left. So instead of going back through the line and getting some more food that we really didn't need, we decided to give the money away to someone who looked like they could use it. I will never forget what I learned that night, both what exactly I can survive on, and also that there are many people that survive that way for every meal of their lives. So in taking on this challenge, I've come to realize that my everyday struggles are nothing in comparison to the struggles of the rest of the world. Most importantly, I was really touched by the man's selflessness and generosity. He was willing to give, even though he didn't have much to give himself. This truly showed us God's love in action. Good morning. My name is Mackenzie O'Connell. On June 15, 53 eager yet sleep-deprived youth and chaperones left for the Orlando airport at 3 a.m. to embark on our life-changing mission trip to Chicago, Illinois. Upon arrival at our host church, the First Church of the Brethren, we were greeted warmly by the door staff, who would be guiding us around Chicago and helping us at workplaces. We traveled to many locations to volunteer. Our work consisted of preparing food at homeless shelters, 
taking apart toys so they could be recycled, participating in bingo and dancing with the elderly, playing games and spending time with the mentally disabled, cleaning up community gardens, and much more. Even though everything we did had such a profound impact on all of the volunteers' lives, I have chosen to speak to you today about my experience at an open land farm with a new friend that I made that I will never forget. Open land farms are community gardens in Chicago that aim to supply the community with free vegetables and fruit and raise local property values. My group went to a garden owned by a sweet lady named Queen. Queen is, Queen is 70 years old, almost completely deaf, and takes care of the large garden all by herself. Before arriving at the garden, everyone in my group was in need of a nap and dreading our three hours of labor in the dirt and hot sun. I thought that this garden would be extremely overgrown and dead, but once we arrived, it was beautiful and filled with flowers and green grass. At the garden, my task was to weed, but others in my group mowed the grass, weed whacked, and organized a compost pile. Throughout the day, Queen said whatever popped into her mind, and it was hilarious and helped make our work much easier. I asked Queen what she did with the vegetables after she harvested them, and her response will forever stick with me. She said, when you eat the vegetables alone, they don't taste good. But when you share them with others and eat them together, they taste much better. Queen's comment meant so much to me because oftentimes I focus on what I don't have rather than the abundance of things I do have. I realized that I should be refocusing more of my energy towards giving other people what they don't have and what they need. Being in Chicago really opened my eyes to the way that others have to live and made me really thankful for everything I have been blessed with. You see, someone like Queen, who hasn't been as fortunate as I have been, gives up all the, all the vegetables she grows to those who need it more, while I, like many teenagers, complain about the few things I don't have. After we finished gardening, my group stepped back to look at what we had done. The garden looked even more beautiful, and every single one of us felt very accomplished. I wouldn't trade that day for anything. The biggest lesson I took from this mission trip is to be thankful for everything I have, even if it's something little. Being in Chicago has opened my eyes to a different kind of world, and because of people like Queen, my life and attitude towards things will forever be changed for the better. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Sean Kenny, and to my left is Dalton Connolly. This is our story. Coming off the Purple Line and entering the serene town of Evanston, Illinois, our group, along with a few others, was on our way to a place named Albany Care. This facility was to house people who suffered from mental disabilities. Walking towards Albany Care, we came across two men who were dancing and waving to us from across the street. These gestures made us feel uncomfortable, and we advised each other not to stare, laugh, nor point. Our group moved, uh, our group moved on towards the facility and walked towards the park that was affili affiliated with Albany Care. To our surprise, both of these men were sitting on the park benches right next to us ten minutes later. As instructed, we confronted the dowdy, unkempt, and dirty men smoking cigarettes on the benches and began conversation. The first man's name was Brian Cater. I asked Brian if he wanted to play me in a game of chess. He said that he'd love to, but that the last time he'd played was 10 years ago, so he was a little rusty on the rules. I asked him where he was from, and he told me that he was born and raised in Chicago. Sean and I told him about how we were from Vera Beach, Florida, on a mission trip for our church. He asked, what in God's name are you doing talking to us? Most people walk past this park with their heads tucked in their jackets and their eyes to the ground. You don't feel intimidated by us? I'd have to admit, there were some intimidating men sitting around the park benches, but Brian wasn't intimidating at all. He was constantly smiling and would never hesitate to laugh. After 10 minutes of small talk, out of the blue, Brian said, I sit here every day from 8 in the morning to 10 at night, and I've been doing that for the last 15 years. When it's raining, I just read the paper inside. I can't even buy my own cigarettes. I don't, even have, I don't even have enough courage to walk across the street. I get $30 a month to spend on whatever I want, and all goes towards cigarettes and coffee. He told Sean and I his entire life story, and he made us promise that we wouldn't share it with anyone. 
The three of us talked for about 45 minutes, and within that time formed a bond that I will remember for the rest of my life. Sean and I walked away from the table and started to talk about what we had just experienced. I started to tell Sean about my Uncle Scott, who had a severe brain injury from a skateboarding accident about seven years ago. I told him how similar Brian was to my uncle, and they seemed to have the same symptoms from their injuries. Mr. Turner, our chaperone, walked up to us and made an interesting point. He said, most of these people here are just like you and me. It's that one teeny part of the mind that keeps them from being normal. Just a small misprint that separates them from us. An old adage popped into our minds at this point. Never judge a book by its cover. Only an hour before we met Brian, we were, were, were we staring and laughing at the two men dancing in the street, not knowing what kind of people they truly were. I think, if we're honest with ourselves, it's safe to say that we've all, at one point, made a judgment based on our first observation of somebody else. All the participants from the 2013 Youth Mission trip would like to share this life lesson with the whole congregation and for all of us to take this allegory as an example that we are all equal. The adults who spent a week away from their family, who slept on the floor with our teenagers, who helped debrief the experiences and who were first and hardest working at the work sites aren't up here, they're with you. And I know you'll be uncomfortable, but I would like to ask those adults who've traveled with us to please stand. And I know that I promised I wouldn't be giving any more orders, but with the teenagers who have traveled with us in the past two weeks to Orlando and Chicago, also please stand. Maybe life's as simple to encompass just three things. Things we know, things we don't know, and things we don't know we don't know. For example, I knew I would be tired this morning. I didn't know how tired I was going to be. And I didn't know that I didn't know that only fools and first-year youth ministers take two mission trips back-to-back -back with a day of work in between. <laughs> but I do now. People ask me often, why Orlando? Why Chicago? When there's so much to be done here in Indian River County. And I love that question, and I love that conversation, because I don't see it as either or, I see it as both and. And I want you to know that our students see it that way too. Of the 16 mission opportunities fulfilled by our youth, those students that traveled fulfilled a minimum of eight this past year. But there are certain vulnerabilities that come from being away from home. A couple of weeks before our mission trips, my wife and I were away from our home while house and pet sitting for some friends of ours and their three dogs and their goldfish and their homemade goldfish pond. The good news is, the three dogs survived just fine. <laughs> the bad news is, the dozen fish or so lasted about a day. See, 
There are things you know, things you don't know, and then things you don't know you don't know. For example, I know how to feed fish. I don't know what I did to kill 12 fish. <laughs> and I didn't know that I don't know that hose water has chlorine in it so that when you fill it up, you're also going to kill the 50 bucks worth of replacement fish you buy your friend. <laughs> but I do now. <laughs> there are things you learn when you are away from home. There are things you see in the vulnerability from being away from home, and I and our students saw many things. In the vulnerability of sleeping on the floor, in the vulnerability of the Chicago Transit Authority, in the vulnerability of being around people who had an easier time reading us than we did reading them, in the vulnerability of not having a room or a cell phone to retreat to for personal space. You see, we spent a year trying to figure out what we knew and then accept what we didn't know, and it was time to go away from home to challenge what we don't know that we don't know. And it was a different type of work this year. In some ways, it was hard to see our impact. When you're given a dollar and told that that's going to be what you use to buy your dinner and whatever the neighborhood provides, when you are doing personal shopping at a food pantry that provides meals, nutrition specific, for those that are dealing with AIDS, when you are at Casa Norte, thrown into a pantry of random ingredients, asked to prepare lunch for 16 to 22-year-old young men who have no other place to go because there's no other system that provides for those too old to be adopted. When you're at the community food garden that is in between the territories of rival gangs that might indeed be set fire again when you're at a daycare facility for adults that have no one else to care for them, it's hard to walk away and see your impact when you know that that need will still be there tomorrow. But it was a beautiful thing to watch our teenagers accept that perhaps God was making a difference through them or and perhaps God was making a difference in them. I was at a gathering once where I heard Pastor Nadia Bowles Weber say, the most powerful thing that you can be is who God made you to be where God put you to be. What we know is that the Spirit of God moved through our time in Chicago. What we don't know is the lasting impact that it will have on that beautiful city and on us. And what we don't know that we don't know is where God's whale is going to spit us out next, metaphorically speaking. So maybe with our mission trippers, in our Jonah story this morning, the message is that God can use our vulnerability and the vulnerability of those around us. And maybe the question is, where is God calling you and I to be vulnerable next? Or at least that's the question for me. Because that who we know holds what we don't know and what we don't know we don't know. And as we use what we know, accept what we don't know and challenge what we don't know we don't know, it no longer becomes important what we know or what we don't know for the sake of the one who created all that we don't know we don't know. <laughs> you know?